Happy Pi Day! In this episode, we're going to implement what's probably the most important part of the game, breaking and placing blocks. Now, this episode is going to be absolutely packed, so don't hesitate to help yourself with the code of my GitHub repository in the description, and the video chaps is on YouTube. But before all that crap, we're going to have to properly address the NDC, which I very briefly went over in episode 6. Until now, we've worked under the assumption in all our math that our basis looked like this, and that, when transformed by a perspective matrix, it's mapped to our screen something like this with the z-axis pointing away from our camera. We worked under this assumption because it makes the movement vector easier to calculate, as it works based on the top-down view we're all familiar with from high school charts and the like, save for the z and y axis which are reversed. Unfortunately though, OpenGL actually assumes our basis looks like this, with the z-axis pointing towards our camera instead of away from it. This is annoying to say the least, because it means all our math is flipped. This is actually why I inverted the rotation and z-position in camera.py back in episode 6, but this isn't a viable long-term solution, because now our z-axis is flipped in world space. So we're going to have to fix this the air quotes hard way, and do our math in relation to this new basis. All in all, this isn't all that complicated, we basically just need to invert all our angles and z-axis here, and also in our on-mouse motion function in main.py. Let's now open world.py to change the terrain generation to something a little less random so it's easier to see what we're doing, and create a few functions to make things a little bit easier for us, namely get chunk position, which will get the chunk position of a certain world position, and get local position, which will get the relative position of a world position inside a chunk. Now, I'm going to cut the get block number function into get block number for getting the actual block number, and is opaque block for checking if the block is opaque or transparent. Don't forget to replace get block number by is opaque block in chunk.py. Next thing we need is a set block function, which starts off by creating a new chunk at the chunk position if one doesn't exist there yet, checks to see if the existing block at the position we passed is different than the one we want to set, and finally sets the block at the local position in our chunk and updates its mesh. We also need to check if our position is located on the chunk border, in which case we'll want to update the mesh for the adjacent chunk too. Let's now test this by continuously setting a plank block, which has a block number of 7, at our camera's position in main.py's update function. As you can see, our current way of generating chunks is pretty slow because, well, Python is a pretty slow language. There are a number of techniques we could use to mitigate this, but here we'll use a subchunk system as kindly suggested by start for killer on my Discord server, as it's pretty easy to implement and works well. Basically, the idea is to split our chunk into smaller subchunk meshes we can update individually and quickly, and then update our actual chunk by simply sticking together all these subchunk meshes into one big mesh we end up sending to the GPU. I'm not going to explain this code very much because it's pretty self-explanatory, and if you understood how chunks worked in episode 8, you'll understand how the subchunk code works. Basically just copy all the code from my chunk.py file, save with the GPU passing code, make our update mesh function, go through all our subchunk meshes, adding them together into one big mesh while adding to the index the right mouse each time, send all that to the GPU, and then delete everything. As usual though, you can find all this code on the GitHub link in the description, blah 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 blah. I'm also making an update subchunk meshes function for updating all subchunk meshes all at once, and finally an update at position function for getting the relevant subchunk based on position, updating its mesh, and checking for adjacent subchunks to update and all that. We're going to be using a subchunk size of 4x4x4, because from my testing it seems to be the sweet spot between speed and memory usage. Making updating chunks consists of just updating a small section, and then sticking pre-calculated sections together, as you can see, significantly improves performance. Now we can move on to the fun stuff, actually breaking and placing blocks based on player input. This is going to involve quite a bit of linear algebra and analytic geometry, so if you're not very comfortable with those subjects, that's okay, just follow along with the code and try and understand my reasoning as best you can. I'll also include resources like I usually do in the description about this stuff, as well as, of course, my GitHub repository. After all, it happens to everyone to get pie-eyed in front of things they don't understand once in a while, right? So if we imagine the player clicking to add or delete a block, what we want is some imaginary line, which we'll call Q, to have the same angle in space as our camera's rotation, and to pass through the point in space defined by our camera's position, and to then see with which blocks it intersects. So let's go ahead and create a new hit.py file and a hit ray class, which takes in our rotation vector comprised of two angles, which it then converts into a unit direction vector of our line, which we'll call u, based on this fairly simple formula. We want it to be unit vector so that we can say, multiply it by a certain length and get a vector we can use to translate points that certain distance. So let's get back to our imaginary line. We could think of a small point called p that can travel across that line and that jumps forward to the nearest intersection with our line and a plane of the three-dimensional grid in which our blocks exist. So let's create a position variable to keep track of the position of our point and a starting position parameter in our init function. This starting position will naturally be the camera's position. So what is the nearest intersection to our point between our line and a plane of the grid? Well, to answer that question, we can try maybe simplifying it a bit. Instead of thinking of all the possible intersections we could have, we can just think of the six faces immediately surrounding P, in which case we can also center these faces around the origin by subtracting the block position in which our point is. This block position 
will be an integer vector we'll call b, and that we can add to our code as the block variable, which just rounds our points position. This works to get the block position in which our point is, because our blocks are one unit wide and centered on integer positions. Now we'll create a step function that does exactly that, takes our points position and subtracts our blocks position from it into a new local position variable. This new point, as well as the shifted line, will be called O and R respectively. Another thing we can do to simplify the question is to disregard all negative faces, as we can just flip our position around the origin on one of its components, if that component of U is negative, to get the same thing but for positive faces. Don't forget to create a vector to remember the sign though. This is also nice because it means we don't need to worry about the sign of U when calculating the intersections. So let's do just that. Create an absolute vector called V as a copy of U and flip it around, as well as O, which will now be called L. So now our question becomes, what is the nearest intersection to L between R and these three faces? To answer this question, we're going to need equations to define R and R faces. R is pretty easy since we already have a directive vector which is V and a point through which to pass which is L. We can create a parametric equation that looks a bit like this. I'm going to focus on the face situated on the x-axis for now, which I'll call Fx, but the same process will apply to all of the other faces. So to get the intersection with a face, we first need the intersection with the plane defined by that face, which I'll call pi. And since our faces are axis aligned, there couldn't be anything easier than the equation of their plane. Stick these two equations together in the same system and solve for x, y, and z, which is just a matter of substituting x and rearranging some stuff, and we get out these three formulas for the intersection between r and pi, which we can easily implement in our code. We can actually skip all of this if vx is equal to zero though, since that would mean that r and pi are parallel, which means that they would never never intersect, which means that, no matter how you slice the pi, we'll have a non-real answer. Now we know where in space the intersection with the plane is, we just need to check if that intersection is actually situated inside our face. This is easy as pi 2, since, again, our faces are axis aligned. Once that's done, we just need to get the distance between the point of intersection and L to move p along q by, by simply using the Pythagorean theorem like this. In the code, we can call a check function which takes that distance, the current block position, and finally, the next block position, which is just going to be the block position adjacent to our face, so incremented by negative 1 or 1 on the relevant component depending on our sign. Now repeat for the other two faces and you're done. The implementation of the check function is pretty straightforward. If the next block is not air, we want to do something, and otherwise we want to move p along q by the distance by multiplying v by the distance and adding that to p. We also need to set the current block position to the next block position and increase a global distance variable by the distance for doing stuff like limiting hit range. And speaking of which, we can actually set a hits range constant equal to 3 here for later. Now our check and step functions both need a hit callback function to know what to do when a block is hit, and both need to return true if that's the case, and false if not, so that we know when to stop, and presto, that's hit.py done. Finally, we just need to import that into main.py, create a hit callback function that takes in the current block position, which will be the position in which to place a block, and the next block position, which will be the position in which to remove, interact with, or sample a block. Take appropriate action depending on which mouse button is pressed. Here, I'm also adding a holding variable that defaults to planks so that I can sample blocks by pressing middle click on them. Then we just need a hit ray object with the appropriate arguments and a while loop that continuously steps our hit ray, either until the step function returns true, or either until we've gone farther than our hit range. Before we run our program though, we need to update our mouse capturing system. I'm going to make it so that when we click on the window, it simply captures the mouse and disregards all other mouse events, and that pressing escape releases it. The cherry on the pie is to also implement the on mouse drag function to just call the on mouse motion function so that we can still move our camera even when we're currently clicking. This will make things feel a bit smoother. And once all that is done, feast your pies on this, we can now place break and sample blocks without a hitch. I've got to admit, when I first got this to work, I had quite the pie-eating grin on my face.